<laughs> so if you guys can tell, Ashley's excited for this next one. I'm really excited. <laughs> like, so I, I love I love anything hand sculpting, anything like, you know, where you put in meticulous detail into things and Chris is like the guy, you know? So mm -hmm. like yeah, this is gonna be another good one. And again, I'm excited for this. And I think for everybody, you know, it's a Sunday. Everyone taking time out of their day to share with us and be our community is just amazing. You're all great. I'm really excited for this. This is going to be a lot of fun. This is a buckle up, definitely double buckle, because you're going to learn a lot of cool stuff from Chris in this presentation for sure. So without further ado, further ado, let's bring him in, everybody. Let's bring in Mr. Chris Costa. <laughs> Hey, Chris. How are you? How's it going? Good. Good. It's a rainy day outside. It's actually pouring water in here. Oh, is it? No, yeah, man. yeah. I bad. think we're getting that tomorrow down here. No, it's pretty bad here, sir, Phil. <laughs> yeah. I like the mood lighting, too. You got a little of the purple going. Do you see that? Yeah. yeah. That's, uh, yeah. that's the Tola YouTube. <laughs> yeah. I'm such a YouTuber these days, man. So that's, yeah. the, that's the style. You have to do it now, right? Yeah. You got to have some kind of thing going on in your background. Yeah. Element, right? <laughs> I've mm -hmm. got the mystery pillow going. Oh, there you go. You nice. haven't revealed any. No, I mystery. What? Only that part today. Only that part. You, know, I'll reveal a little bit. I want, more I want some. Here. Yeah. A little, a little bit, maybe. There you go. A little bit more. I, I'm going to reveal some of it as we go along throughout the, through the days here, just for fun and giggles. So, Chris, thanks for uh, for joining us. Uh, we're really excited to have you here. Uh, I hope I don't let you down. No, I'm like, I'm like, oh, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> So we're going to uh, put your screen up and let you start taking control over this. And then as okay. questions come through, we'll try and throw them at you where we can. So anybody feel free, feel, feel free, feel free to throw up some questions or and we'll find the right times to <laughs> so, ask Chris as This well. is my shameless plug right there. So like my, my uh, humble school. <laughs> so if you guys want to check out, learn from me, uh, that's a good place to start. Uh, so let's start with uh, my presentation itself. Uh, the idea today, because uh, if you remember, you know, it's like a couple of years ago at the summit 2018, I approached the whole thing, like going to like fine detail and doing all that, that kind of stuff, but not so much in terms of the structure and how to observe the form. And I think uh, these fundamentals are very important. So I'm definitely going to be doing some demonstrations about like the detail and all that stuff. But uh, I'm going to focus a lot on the, you know, how to observe the form and how to uh, understand the subtlety and things like that. I think it's going to be an interesting one uh, if you haven't seen it yet. So uh, realism idealized. Uh, what does that mean? Like, is, it's, is that some kind of like a pretentious term? <laughs> Probably is. <laughs> no, not really. Uh, it's about like uh, interpreting reality, you know. Um, when you have, uh, for example, like with, when someone invented like the, 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 the photography, right? Like, so all of a sudden you, you didn't rely on illustrations or paintings or anything. You have to rely, uh, you, you could rely actually on photographing something and capturing reality as it, it was without having to interpret it. Uh, and then a lot of people start questioning, you know, it's like, oh, maybe uh, painting is not going to be necessary anymore. Now we have photography, right? Obviously that wasn't the case. There is always space for the artistic interpretation, right? And uh, so my whole goal, like uh, doing my experiments uh, and doing my personal work and even professional work, it, it's about experimenting and learning with uh, what I see. You know, it's like so reality uh, to me is very intriguing. Uh, sometimes it can be very twisted, <laughs> but I like to focus on the, you know, it's like, for example, if I'm uh, doing a portrait, I try to interpret what I see. For example, like if I if I look at the skin, I want to understand what makes the skin the skin. And I want to understand the structures of the skin so I can actually uh, use that understanding to recreate and, uh, and uh, you know, it's like I can basically like come up with a character completely random and having the understanding of how the direction of the wrinkles and pores and all this stuff, like how things relate to each other. Uh, I can recreate something out of no nothing, basically, and make it look realistic. So that's the whole intention. Uh, I'm going to start like talking about the form hierarchy. And I think the, the main thing that we are so constrained to, uh, it starts with the primary, secondary, and tertiary forms. You know, it's like you, we always use those terms. And especially if you come from a, from a traditional background, there is no way to escape from that, right? Because all those forms are in, in, interdependent and they depend, uh, like the, the next step depends on the previous step. So if you're sculpting it with clay, 
you need to nail your primary forms first because you're going to need to establish your planes. You're going to need to establish the distance be between the elements, so like proportions and everything, before you can move on to the next step, which is the secondary forms. And then you're going to go, uh, you can see my cursor, right? Yeah. So for example, like if I look at this image in here, my primary forms would be like a, basically like the, the shape of the head itself, the distance between the elements and everything. But if I could simplify this, you would see just a bunch of planes and, and not a lot of uh, form in there. The secondary forms would be everything else that you see in here. For example, I, I, this specific piece here, I don't have any tertiary forms, which would be like the pores and wrinkles and the super fine stuff. So everything here is basically secondary forms, right? Uh, but over time, like uh, treating things as primary, secondary, and tertiary forms, uh, uh, those terms became a little bit obsolete to me uh, because I'm talking about digital art here. So when you talk about digital art, you're not dependent on the previous step. So let's say if I'm sketching something like this, I'm not sketching just the primary forms before I move, uh, you know, before I move to the secondary forms. I'm gonna try to uh, to represent the expression as a whole. So I'm gonna sculpt my primary and secondary at the same time, almost like if I was sketching on the paper, but in 3D, that's the, the, the ideal uh, for me. And uh, so in that, in that case, I started to treat things as fract, uh, uh, like a form, uh, any form in the, in the face, for example, as a fractal progression. Um, so if I uh, show you, for example, like let me just share some screens here, just to illustrate what I mean by that. So in nature, you're gonna find things like this, for example, this is obvi obviously a tree, like tree branches, uh, but then you're going to find in the human body, for example, this, which is like lungs, right? Like you have your lungs compared to this, it's pretty much like a fractal. So the forms, they just like evolve into smaller versions of themselves. So it's just like a repetition. You're going to find this in nature in many different things. For example, you're going to get a very like a, uh, uh, math mathematical expressions, basically, that create like the the matrix of everything that exists right so you're going to find in plants in uh in ice for example like a snowflake right everything is very mathematical you're going to find for example uh veins when i was like researching how i could create like micro veins for the for the eyeball for example or or like micro veins for the nose and things like that i started to uh, look at lightning for example and i actually made some alphas out of lightning to recreate those little veins you know and uh, they work great actually they, they work perfectly so th there's this fascination uh, that I have about like this repetition you know it's like things that happen to human body reflected in nature in plants uh, uh, you know uh, in the sky for example like galaxies and things like that the shape of a galaxy uh, almost like mirror to the shape of a neuron in your brain you know uh, very interesting stuff so I started to look at form as a fractal progression and a good example of that is when you look at something like this if you don't know uh, Daniel uh, Boshon, uh, this uh, guy, he actually created this technique. He uses like a, a robot to actually photograph and create something he calls a uh, face cartography. So those are images like 900 megapixels images. And I have some examples in here. If you go to gigapan.com, you can just type his name in there, uh, Daniel Boshon, and you're going to find a lot of those images. And the cool thing about this is that you can get like really, really close to the uh, to everything, right? Like you can mm -hmm. see all type of detail. So the cool thing about this, isn't that crazy? Yeah, but, especially when you like go to the whiskers, they look like uh, like like fishing line or something. Yes, like that. you go exactly. to his, his mustache; it looks like fishing line. Yeah, and cool. you can see the dust and everything. You know, it's like it's incredible. Uh, yeah. So. You know, it's like, imagine this, like if I'm talking about like a traditional sculpture of a, of a head, for example, and I'm talking about primary forms, I'm going to definitely like, you know, pick up like, uh, if I blur my eyes, I can pick up the, the shape of the ears in here. So sizes, distances, planes and things like that. And then you have the secondary forms. Like I said, those, those uh, shapes, like, let's say like the major folds in here, uh, you know, it's like those are all secondary. And then as you get closer, you're going to see like the tertiary forms, like the wrinkles and the pores and everything. But then this is all a matter of context, right? Because let's say if I'm sculpting an eye, for example, like this area of the eye here, and I just imagine, you know, it's like, what are the primary forms in here in this context, right? Then you're going to start seeing like, okay, so the shape of the eyeball itself, it's actually affecting the surface of the skin in here, bulging the, the eyelids. And I'm treating the eyelids now as being the primary forms. And within this context, I'm going to have like some 
uh, uh, smaller forms in here, like, uh, you know, it's slightly smaller, which are going to be those folds in here, my, my secondary forms in relation to it. And then as you get closer and closer, you know, everything becomes part of a context. So in that context, I cannot treat anymore as primary, secondary, and tertiary, because at any time, anything can become primary, secondary, and tertiary, because it's a matter of like how much you're approaching the, the subject, right? So that's why I decided to actually call things, you know, it's like a fractal progression, you know, it's like... Uh, in terms of uh, sketching in motion, uh, like I said, when I'm sketching something for my classes, for example, or in, in this case here was a, a, a portrait of Rich, uh, Hitchcock, which was based on this single picture here, uh, found on the internet, I thought it was pretty cool. It's kind of like he was looking to the side, in my case, he was looking more, you know, it's like down. Uh, but just like trying to capture that emotion, you know, it's like uh, by sketching. Uh, freely without having a ton of reference or anything, just like trying to capture that emotion, you know. Uh, sometimes when you're too constrained by using those terms, primary, secondary, and tertiary forms, you get constrained and you don't feel like, uh, you know, it's like uh, you don't have the freedom to actually express things um, uh, in a way. Uh, so instead of like focusing too much about like nailing the proportions or anything, I just start doing my, my sketches. And then if the proportions don't quite work, uh, you know, with ZBrush or, or some other tools, you know, it's like you you have like a, a multi-resolution. So at any time, you can go back to the lowest resolution, adjust your primaries, go a little higher, adjust your secondary, and you keep going with that, you know, it's like, but without interfering with expression itself. Um, when it comes to collision in weight, what I call collision, uh, it's basically all those forms, for example, like you have those shapes here of the nasal labial in here, you have your cheeks, you have your muzzle area. Uh, in, in all those forms, they are actually interacting with each other. They are not alone. So uh, it creates a kind of like a ripple effect, you know, it's like every time you have a facial expression, the facial expression uh, is created by a bunch of levers that we have underneath all the muscles pulling things, in, and when they pull things, I mean, they are pulling skin, they are pulling uh, fat tissue, they are pulling like uh, loose skin, all kinds of things. And all those forms, they are creating this ripple effect. For example, when you have a smile, uh, in the smile here, so a little bit of the corner of the nose is going to be pulled up, the nasal label is going to come up, this whole area of the, the lower lid is going to come up as well, creating a little bit of a squint. So everything is pulled and it creates a ripple effect. So all those forms, they depend on each other. They push each other um, and they are never alone. So um, the, the the best way I can describe this, like when I'm sculpting, for example, uh, is that uh, I've never used the standard brush uh, for basically like anything. Uh, I only use a standard brush, I believe, just like for veins. If I'm sculpting veins, it still works great. But for the most part, for anything like this, I always use the clay buildup. And the clay buildup is cool because it respects the boundaries between the, the different forms. So if I'm sculpting like the muzzle in relation to the, the cheekbone in here, uh, the, 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 the cheeks, uh, then I'm going to have that crease right in between there. And the, the clay buildup actually helps to create those creases very naturally, you know, it's like, um, and then there's the weight as well, right? Uh, as you age, you're going to get a lot of the gravity affecting the forms and everything. And, uh, you know, it's like in this case here, I even made a little bit of a joke in here. I made like this big fat piece in here, just like uh, colliding against the, the table in there. Um, and then you have uh, something that I call the bone landmarks and they are totally dependent on the age as well. So if I bring up some other image in here, let's uh, see my bone landmark. So you have those things here called the fat pads, right? So the fat pads happen in everybody's faces, right? When you're young, you have like this full, beautiful faces. Not not everybody, right? I've never had a full, beautiful face, but you know what I mean? Uh, and then, <laughs> so, so like, uh, you have like those, those fat pads pretty tight against each other, right? Like, so everything is very full, but as you age, they shrink. And so they start shrinking. And then as they shrink, they start revealing more of the bony structures underneath. So you have your zygomatic bony here starting to show up quite a bit. And not only that, but the muscles, they become a little bit weaker as well and thinner and they lose volume. So, for example, you can see at the masseter in here, losing volume and become a little bit uh, tighter against the, the skull. So that's why, you know, when you see someone older, you see the, the, the skull structure underneath, like quite visibly, depending on, you know, let's say like a nine year old or something like that. So those things actually end up like revealing a lot of the, the form structures in there. 
Um, so this is very important to keep in mind if you're sculpting like a, a certain ages. Remember that, you know, it's like if you're not sculpting someone who's completely emaciated, uh, you're probably going to have to have a more naturalistic feel to the whole structure instead of like wanting to represent all the muscles everywhere just to show that you know where they are. You know, it's like the whole thing about people are so obsessed with like representing muscles, almost like the character has to be completely flexed at all times, you know. I, I'm quite the opposite. I like to represent, <laughs> I like to represent the forms very naturalistic. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so keeping that in mind. Uh, the form subtlety and the flow. Uh, Form subtlety to me is one of the main aspects of what makes a portrait to look cool and appealing. And it's all in the, the secondary forms if you consider secondary forms, right? In, in my case, it's just part of the processing here. But uh, the form subtlety is, is something like this, for example. Even though this is a sketch, there's a lot of concern about how the forms interact with each other. So if you get this area here, for example, right, just a quick example. Uh, you're going to see like I have this form in here between the lower lip and this one here. So there's one form in here, another one in here. There's a tiny one in here. There is a fourth one, fourth and fifth in here. There is a sixth one right there. So like all those things, uh, they are very subtle, uh, you know, it's like between, you know, it's like in terms of the relationship they have. Same with those transitions. I mean, like if I'm transitioning from the nasal labial here towards my zygomatic those forms, you know, it's like the way they interact with each other. Uh, I don't need to make them scream, you know, it's like I don't need to make them really pop straight away. So that's why the best way for me to sculpt uh, portraits, uh, I use a clay build up with a very low intensity, I would say like a two or three and create very, very thin layers. Uh, so that way I can actually build the subtleties in between those forms. For example, like you see this form in relation to this one here. So, and then in relation to the zygomatic, there's three forms very distinct in here, but they don't scream. They're just like, it's a small, uh, subtle transition between those forms, you know, so it's very important. And the flow happens naturally because if you are able to actually present those transitions in a subtle way, one form is going to flow into the next one and it's going to be very harmonic at the end. Uh, another, another thing to keep in mind is like uh, when you start to look at the super detail uh, models like a uh, super fine like detail in terms of uh, wrinkles and pores uh, the distance that you are representing the character in relation to the observer right like so if you're doing like a close-up shot you're definitely gonna want to you know to to show off like all the detail that you added and everything but if it's like let's say like a portrait that's like head uh, to waist for example, so like a, a full portrait, like with the waist and up, uh, you probably don't need to have like all this detail represented in there. Uh, but at the same time, uh, because my approach is always trying to keep things as uh, physically accurate as possible, the fine detail affects everything, affects like the specular, affects the the the, the sebum, which is basically like the the the, the how you call it, like the sweat pass in in the face. Everything is affected by the surface itself, right? Uh, so, obviously, you can simulate things with some roughness maps and, and other things like that, but in order to represent uh, the, the the face as I think he should be represented, you know, it's like physically accurate, it's very important that you keep uh, the tertiary forms and you make them very tight and, and, and nicely done, you know. Um, so, physically accurate renders for form evaluation. What I mean by that is this. Let me just bring this one up as well. Um, some examples here, let's say there's some light lighting comparisons in here. So for example, if I see something in ZBrush, right? So I have my, this is like from my portrait of Velasquez. Uh, if I have something like this, I'm sculpting and I have a very good idea about where the forms are and, um, and everything. Uh, I can use like the quick ZBrush render as well and ZBrush has some HDRI uh, cap cap capabilities as well. You can use the uh, key shot as well. But in my case, I mean, it's part of my workflow to use Maya with uh, Arnold. So what I try to do from the get go, as soon as I have like a sketch, way before I have something like this, I start throwing uh, those uh, models into uh, Maya and start to do some renders straight away. And then over time, I start ac actually adding different types of um, uh, lighting that I can experiment with. So this is like the model, the same model Velasquez, but render in Arnold. Uh, so experimenting with the lighting itself 
to be able to evaluate the forms because it's very easy to you know it's like to get lost when you don't have like a physically accurate uh, uh, representation certain volume is going to look correct from a certain angle under certain lighting but then when you switch the lighting it looks completely off so uh, having like different lighting setups you can test things is very important to be able to evaluate how the forms actually are um, physically, right? And then uh, the last thing you hear is about refining your eye. It's, uh, it's back to that same example of, you know, it's like the more you look, the more you learn, right? Like uh, if you want to stop around right here, you know, it's like in, in all these treat the portrait as something that you don't go beyond this point. It's fine too, you can do that. But the more you look, the closer you look, the more you learn about the structures are made. You know, it's like the directions, everything. So refining the eye is about that. You know, it's like every time you look at a, a, a piece of, you know, you're, you're working on, you start seeing more and more things and they evolve quite a lot. I mean, like from my first sketches for my portraits all the way to the final piece, they are very different. You know, it's like it's, it's this inc incremental um, uh, understanding of how the form behaves. Uh, Injecting life. This is another uh, part of the presentation here. Uh, if you guys have any questions, do you have any anything, Paul or or Ashley? Yeah, a couple of questions came through. Yeah, um, I, I shared the website with them, and then some were asking, "How long do you give yourself to do these yeah. these pieces?" All those pieces. Yeah. So uh, I would say, like my my main goal before was to actually create one of those portraits and use it uh, as a leverage for future portraits, right? So I could reuse the skin, the structures, all this stuff. But then uh, uh, obviously like when I started my school, I was like, now I'm gonna have to do this to show my students, right? So mm -hmm. um, instead of like leveraging like everything, I, I had to actually start everything from scratch every single time. So every single portrait you see is basically from scratch, which have, uh, you know, a few things, let's say like specular maps and things like that, sometimes I leverage from, from the, the previous models. But uh, everything is from scratch. So I start doing the class and I spend four weeks with my students and I get to a point that the model looks uh, good enough, but I probably not like completely finished, but at least like all the techniques are in place. Um, I just have to, you know, take my time to actually refine things from that point and finish it up. So I would say after I finish my class, this is one month, I would say two to three weeks after that, that's what I would take to finish it. Uh, so I would say a month and a half probably for each one of those pieces. Wow. That would be yeah. something like that. It's a lot of dedication. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, it looks great. <laughs> yeah. It's worth this, it. one, this one here, for example, that's the stage that I had when I finished my latest class. This is like a portrait of uh, uh, Frank Frazetta, it's still in progress. I can show you the some other shots. So uh, I, I have actually the, the, the ones I have in, in Maya. It's a little bit further than this because uh, at the end of the class, I already had some of the hair and uh, eyebrows and eyelashes and all this stuff. It looks like this. This is like uh, when I stopped uh, during my class. And then I, I have some of the hair as well. I can show you guys later. But uh -huh. yeah, about the about, about month and a half for sure. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. To yeah. a lot of people, that would be fast too. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I love the sketches. The one to two day sketches, they're fun. But yeah, this takes a lot of dedication. Yeah, uh, I, I don't even want to know where I begin trying to do a I have a something I've always wanted to do, and portraits scare me. <laughs> no, they'll be scared. Yeah. You just have to go like uh, Jack the Ripper. You go by, uh, part by part, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's, I think, for everything, right? You just got to <laughs> do it. You got to do, do it, right? Do the do. -do. <laughs> So uh, yeah, back here, so like the injecting life, this is the part that's the most interesting for me when it comes to portraits, right? Uh, one thing is to be able to create something that's technically accurate uh, and then you can have like uh, something looking completely realistic, but at the same time, at the risk of not looking uh, uh, alive, right? Like uh, looking lifeless. So I have a, a piece, is special attention to making sure that my characters look alive, that they have intention, that they have thoughts. And there are a couple of ways to approach that. Like some of them are very technical. I'm gonna be exploring that next. But uh, at the end of the day, what I try to do with my portraits is simply like emulate reality, right? Like I'm not trying to uh, create something that's absolutely real because I'm not using scans. I'm not using ready-made materials. Uh, uh, with the tools that we have nowadays, you know, it's like with the uh, texturing XYZ, you have like uh, uh, the, the 3D scan store, you know, it's like you have a lot of awesome resources you can use to create super mm -hmm. realistic stuff. 
But uh, in my case, I'm into this exploration about like how can I create something that's convincing enough, you know, it's like a it, it, uh, character that looks alive, that the skin looks alive um, by uh, imitating reality, but not like a one to one. It's basically like trying to understand how reality works, the structures of the skin, the structures of everything, uh, you know, it's like how the, the this fractal uh, ev uh, evolution of the form happens as well, and try to recreate that in a way that if I want to apply those techniques to a monster, for example, to a creature, I can do that and create something that looks very realistic without without having the need of having an actual creature in front of me, you know, it's like to, to copy simply, like do a, a carbon copy of it. Uh, studying the subject is very important. I, uh, I can tell you, for example, let me just open another file here. Let me just make sure that I don't get confused. Just a second, let me just get this. Yeah, I love that you're mentioning all of this is applicable like outside of your portraiture as well. Oh yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, some of my students actually, they started to apply this to creatures and it looks very, very cool. I mean, like a, okay. there's some amazing stuff out there. So for example, this guy here, this is my Frank Frazetta. So normally when I start my my works, uh, you know, it's like I, I create a folder and then I create my structure for my Maya files and everything. I have a ZBrush file uh, folder in there and I have my references. And then I try to collect as many references as I can of the character I'm gonna be representing. And at different ages, you know, it's like trying to keep everything in mind. Um, uh, in this case here, Frank Frazetta, to me, he was one of the best, like, uh, 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 cover artists, you know, it's like back in the day in Brazil, I used to collect those uh, magazines called Crypta, uh, which in the United States, they are creepy. It's kind of like similar to heavy metal, a lot of horror stories and stuff like that, like comics. And Frank Frazetta, he, I remember like the best covers were like all, all like oil painting. Uh, he did all of those covers, you know, it's like they're incredible. So he was a big inspiration for sure. So I decided to actually uh, make a portrait of him. He had a uh, you know, it's like a, a stroke at some point, so he got like a, a, his eye got affected and everything. But I decided to go with an age that's a little bit uh, after this, so it's kind of like a, probably his fifties. He actually used to to use himself as a model for his uh, for his uh, heroes and everything. There's a picture in there with the <laughs> Clint Eastwood. So looking at all those portraits before I even start doing any sculpture is very important to understand the forms. You know, it's like to see what parts uh, actually strike you the most. You know, it's like he has a very peculiar eye area, his nose as well. And then it's almost like a caricature artist, you know, it's like who before does uh, uh, like the final version of it, does lots of tests, you know, so I can see what parts you can actually exaggerate and everything. But in this case, instead of exaggerating, I'm just observing, trying to capture uh, the facial expression, the intention, you know, it's like uh, uh, what kind of expression I'm gonna give him, if it's gonna be a smiling one or not. Uh, some of my characters I, I represent like with the smiles and everything. In his case, I think you're gonna keep his mouth uh, closed. But uh, yeah, try to understand first like the, uh, the the mood, you know. So the mood and intention, obviously. In the case of Velasquez, I mean, I want to create this version of him that he he had this gaze, you know, it's like that was kind of like a a little bit like a. Uh, almost like a sleepy here, <laughs> but uh, at the same time having this. Uh, it's almost like you can rest on him, you know, it's like when you're looking at the portrait. Uh, so it's a, a kind of like a calming type of expression. It's at the same time looking at him uh, in a state of wonder, you know. So, for example, he's, he has this slightly looking to the side. And uh, so the eye gaze is important to me uh, to represent this type of intention, you know. It's like, for example, if I open some of my pieces in here, uh, in her case, for example, I like this type of you know, gaze like looking slightly up into the side because it makes you connect in a way, you know, it's like it's almost like you're looking at someone who has thoughts. And this has to do with the technical part as well. The technical part is about uh, how you, you create your eyes, like your uh, CG eyes. And normally when people place the, the CGI in there within the skull uh, at the 90 degrees, so like facing straight forward, it looks completely crossed eye, right? Like, so the model, uh, it's crossed eye. I'm gonna explain that after. But normally what you have is about like three, 
five, seven degrees of rotation outwards. And that happens because there is a kappa, that's a term that's used, that is actually the, the axis between like the Rs and, uh, you know, it's like, it's a little hard to explain, but uh, the fact is like, if you're looking, for example, if you extend your arm and look at your finger, for example, uh, your eyes are probably gonna go more straight, I would say 90 degrees. As you get closer to your nose, let's say really close to your nose, just a few inches, then you're gonna get crossed eye. But if you're looking uh, to a distant place, for example, like a mountain, uh, through your window, uh, your eye is going to start to diverge a little bit, right? You're going to rotate back to this about like five degrees mm -hmm. outwards, and then you're going to get the more naturalistic feel, you know? So when you're trying to represent some character that you want the character to, uh, uh, to you know, be believable, someone who has thoughts is looking far away and having thoughts about something, then you normally add this rotation, you know? It's like, and you kind of like fake that. So very important. Uh, lighting as a storyteller, uh, it's very important as well. Uh, always, you know, depending on the type of uh, uh, story you're going to tell, obviously, this is all from the internet, obviously. But in cinematography, you know, it's like you're going to have like some color codes, you know, it's like you're going to have uh, a, a color language, right? Like certain uh, symbols that you use in a movie, for example, uh, depending on the type of character. That character is associated with the green light, for example, or to a uh, bluish light or something like that. So the elements in the scene always follow that structure, you know. And also the lighting here as a storyteller, for example, like in this case here, the same portrait under different lighting, for example, you're going to see this, uh, you know, the very intense looking here. You're going to see this type of lighting from below. Uh, in, uh, you know, covers of magazines, like for horror movies, for example, or, or posters, you know, it's like it's this very intense look. And then you have something that's much more subtle, uh, which is like a more portrait lighting, like a more traditional yeah. portrait lighting. And then this is more like a flashlight, so it kind of like a, washes out all the detail and then uh, flattens the whole face, right? So, um, yeah. So someone asked for your mm -hmm. maps, yeah. your diffuse normal displacements. You're using yep. ZBrush to do all of those. Cause you're all of those, yeah. I'm going to go over them. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see how I'm going to do uh, Halfway already. It goes fast, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. halfway. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it goes super fast. So those are another, other studies also trying to capture, like, you know, what type of lighting would represent the, the character with the mood that I wanted, you know. Uh, same for those, for those guys in here. I mean, like, I was doing all those tests. Uh, with different HDRIs to see what type of mood I would go for that character. Same with this ones here. So uh, for lighting, you can go to HDRI Haven, uh, which they changed the name now, but if you type HDRI Haven, uh, you still can find a website. Uh, I, I download all my HDRIs from there, you know. So uh, let's go keep going here. So uh, uh, the details that draw your eye, I'm gonna go back to another one that I just showed you guys. Uh, which is a good example, I think. This one here, for example. So when you when, uh, you're sculpting a, a female or young children, for example, the forms are very subtle, right? Like you don't have a lot to rely on. It's not like sculpting an old man; you can hide a lot of the problems with uh, with uh, wrinkles and everything. So, uh, but you still can can see certain things gonna draw your eye in here. And I would say like the first thing that draws your eye are the eyes themselves, because you have this connection since you're a baby, you know, so you connect to your mother or whoever is taking care of you, is this direct connection. So the first thing you're gonna look normally in the character is the eyes, and then everything that surrounds the eyes. So if you have like a, a structures that need to look like soft, for example, uh, uh, you know, it's like those wrinkles here is basically going to help a lot to represent this type of uh, soft skin around it, some flexible skin. Mm -hmm. If I created those wrinkles, for example, just as a single wrinkle in here, it would not look as interesting. If I didn't pay attention to the hierarchy of those forms in here, it's, it would not sell the idea that it looks alive. But when you start introducing like those secondary folds, you know, it's like it's almost like, okay, I can feel that that's a form that is actually soft. I can actually understand that. Uh, same for those wrinkles in here. So you see, like, if you look overall, you don't see a lot of forms in here. Everything is very subtle. But those details around here, the the, the eye around here, uh, obviously the, the nasolabial little wrinkles in here, lips, those things capture your attention. So there's there are certain landmarks in the face that always capture your attention and make you understand as uh, being uh, alive, you know, it's like, so those are some of them. Then obviously you have the symmetry. If you get like a 
Giger in here as an example. It's another portrait I made. There is this asymmetry in here. It's based on a, a couple of photographs I found of, on, of him online. So we, you see there's a little bit of this uh, smirk on the side in here. Uh, like I said before, everything is motivated. So uh, the, the, the side of the, the nose in here is going to be pulled up slightly. You know, it's like it's slightly it start to become like a squint in here as, as you go over uh, higher and higher with the cheeks. Uh, you know, this asymmetry is the, the only way you're going to be able to actually capture likeness for the most part, because most faces are completely asymmetrical, not completely, but mostly asymmetrical. Um, and then the pose itself, like if you're talking about the portrait, my poses are always very, very subtle. It's always like a little bit uh, slightly tilt to the head, for example, to a side like this. Uh, uh, you know, it's like in portrait, I mean, like you, you're going to be talking about... Uh, uh, someone coming to a studio and i have my old rick baker in here as well like if you remember uh you bringing someone to the studio you want to make sure that this person is actually sitting comfortably there you know it's like he it has a, a connection with the camera and uh, the pose is it's very subtle you know it's like if you don't you don't want to get the the person to do a lot of gymnastics in there like for a pose <laughs> so normally normally Flip very it. subtle no stuff clips. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then the website, just uh, I put the website in chat. Uh, it's mm -hmm. now called Polyhaven. Oh, Polyhaven. Yes, that's right. That, that's it. Now right? they have models as well and yeah. everything. They yeah. are really great, man. They do serious work. Oh, I'm not related to any of those people actually that I'm talking about here, like any of them, uh, like in terms of uh, being associated with them. But I really uh, like what they make. It, that's why I, I plug their work like without getting getting anything in exchange. But uh, with HDRI Haven uh, in the past, I remember like I paid, I think it was like five bucks or something in their Patreon. And they gave me access to the entire Google Drive. So. You can wow. go to the Google Drive. You can download all the HDRIs straight away. I don't know if they still have that. They probably do. So check that first. And then if they do, it, it's totally worth it, you know. Wow, that's a great deal. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. And then when it comes to the detail here, accessories and everything, obviously, if you're telling a story, you're going to have to put in the context of, you know, it's like it's, uh, it's uh, a piece that's kind of like someone who lived in the past, right? You're going to have to research the type of outfit and, you know, it's like the, uh, the costume that they used like back in the days uh, and everything. And then everything is going to be part of the, the story being told in here. Uh, the story can be told by a bunch of characters or it can be just like a simple portrait. Uh, as long as you have like the right facial expression, you know, it's like the, the, the mood, the lighting is correct, like the costume is correct, you know, uh, you can tell stories by just having a simple portrait. Uh, here are a couple of measurements I brought up as well. Uh, that Those are very important and they are just like averages, obviously, but uh, they, are, they can be very helpful for you guys. When you're working with uh, actual renders, let's say like physically accurate renders like Arnold in Maya, you want to make sure that the everything is um, it's uh, like like world scale, right? Like otherwise the subsurface scattering, the scale of the subsurface scattering is not going to work. Things like that. So I keep everything physically accurate as as, as much as possible. So for the head uh, average height, you're going to use about nine inches. Something between eight point six to nine point four would be like the you know the the size the the height of the face, and then the eyeball is going to be about twenty four millimeters. Can be a little bit uh, smaller, a little bit bigger. In the case of uh, my uh, Frazetta, I actually made slightly bigger, so I think it's close to 25. It's 24 some point something. Uh, the iris average radius is about half of that, so you can have that as a reference. This is important because otherwise you start making the eyes too tiny or too big. Sometimes it's intentional. Sometimes you want to make the eyes bigger to look cuter, so it's like uh, closer to like a baby or. a or a, a, you know, a small child proportion. So we want to make that. And if you want to make more creature looking like, you know, then you're going to make the eyes smaller. But in general, those are the proportions for a, you know, average human. The uh, pupillary average distance, this is basically when you go to, to have like your eyes exempt, uh, they're going to actually measure the distance between the pupils. So if you get this ballpark here around 63 millimeters, you're in a good spot. Uh, the eye rotation, like I said, uh, about five degrees outwards, you're going to rotate them between three and ten average. So sometimes if you want to make a slightly more wall-eyed, you know, it can increase that. I think my Frazetta is about like maybe six, something like that, because I, I noticed that his eyes uh, are a little bit uh, further. Uh, and then 
when it comes like to the to the grooming part, then you have some averages here that are important as well. So the eyebrows are going to get between 250 and uh, 1100 per eyebrow. Uh, 250 for plucked eyebrow, obviously. If, if it's unplucked, then a higher number. Uh, eyelashes, uh, the upper eyelashes between uh, 90 and 150. So let's say 150 compared to the lower 175 in average in there. So like double at the top than the bottom. They're normally at the bottom, they are thinner as well. Uh, and, uh, you know, a little bit more spaced out. Uh, for the scalp itself, around 100,000 follicles. And for the beard, which is not her case, <laughs> 30,000. <laughs> and uh, most of the concentration is around the chin and the, the muzzle area. So we're going to get between five and 20, uh, 25,000 around this area specifically. And then let's go dive into the skin itself. Let's talk about like patterns by region, tone by region, depth, direction, all this stuff. So I'm going to open a couple of websites here for you to take a look. So the first one is going to be the direction. Let's get the, let's get Carla in here. And for example, like you're going to find like different patterns around the face. Uh, you're going to find out, for example, around the chin in here, you're going to have this direction. You're going to see those micro wrinkles in here that you're going to start actually creating a little bit of a, a you know, it's like a circle in here. So they start going down in this direction, down in here. They start going in a circle right here. And they're going to start going almost like a, a, a round. How can I say that? So if, if you have like the muscle area here around the, the, the lips being a circle, they're going to try to follow the uh, the perpendicular way. You know, it's like so basically like those lines are going to happen vertically in here, slightly diagonal here, more horizontal in here, and then they're going to keep going that way. So those are like micro wrinkles I'm talking about here. They are going over the pores themselves in here. Then you're going to get so certain areas, for example, the frame of the lips. You're going to have those micro little wrinkles at the very edge of the lips in here. And they're going to start getting bigger and bigger and then becoming the lips themselves. Uh, then they start actually blending back to the pores themselves in here. So getting closer to that. The nose itself, the pores are very shallow. You're going to get those, uh, you know, those black heads and everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the peach fuzz as well. You're going to be seeing here in the ears as well. So it's amazing stuff. Uh, in terms of the type of skin, uh, the the chin, uh, the, uh, the, the cheeks area and the muzzle area in the chin, they're going to be somehow similar. Uh, and also they look a little bit more like spread out. So the pores look a little bit more spread out in those areas because they're more bulged, right? Like you're going to have like a, the, the, the bulge of the, the teeth pressing against the, the muzzle area here. You have the chin itself, you have the cheeks. So there are broad areas. So they look like they're more spread out. But in terms of structure, they're fairly the same across the whole face. They just change certain directions. You know, when you get to the forehead, you're going to get a little bit more of a horizontal line like that. They're going to, you know, it's like the, the pores start to actually become more horizontal in that way. There's this very interesting little area here. In her case, not very visible, but you have a lot of micro wrinkles, very horizontal right around here. And imagine that every single wrinkle, when you look at the face like this, they are basically a memory of the facial expression. So you have the facial expression. You know, it's like over time, you do the facial expression for years and years of your life. When you're older, you're going to have those, uh, you know, wrinkles pretty much like very well marked in there. It's almost like a, an echo of the past, you know, it's like all the, the movement that your face did across the years, as you can tell by looking at Roger here, right? Roger has. So when you were sharing the one with the measurements, someone was asking, uh, mm -hmm. are those measurements per, for example, they're asking per the eyebrow or you're doing the same density per side? Uh, uh, well, I, I start doing that, yes, but because I had a lot of variation in my grooming, uh, you know, it's like I can actually make things a little bit thinner in one side than the other side. But mm -hmm. overall, yes, I start that way. In the case, uh, I mean, like certain people are going to have like scars. My son has a little scar in his eyebrow, for example, going to have to deal with that as well. But overall, yes, it's the same for both. Okay. And then you're using for your hair and your eyebrows, you're using, what are you using to do that? Oh, let me, uh, let me, I can jump right into it here. Let's see. So my Maya here, I can show you what I have for my eyebrows and everything. So this is the model in Maya and I'm using next gen for everything. Mm -hmm. So I can show you like the eyebrows that look like this right now. Um, let's say, uh, if I 
break everything down here. So for example, I have my eyebrows in here. I have a bunch of different patterns that I use in here, different modifiers. So I start with the clump. So first I have my guides in here. So like I start with the eyebrows pretty much like straight like that. So I have my guides in next gen <laughs> that I just show like this. So they follow a certain direction. They normally create this V shape. So like you have those little V shapes in here. Uh -huh. So when I turn them on, I actually force the uh, the eyebrows to follow that direction. But then later I start to incorporate like, okay, let me add some clump, you know, get some clumping going on and then some noise as well. Uh, the noise I tend to actually exaggerate a lot in next gen because uh, if I try to do something more subtle, normally in the render, it doesn't look right. So I try to do that. But uh, in terms of the hair, you know, uh, I can show you what I have for my actual hair. And here is not done yet. But for example, this is the main mm -hmm. upper part of the hair. So I'm actually separating the upper part from the sides. So that's not finished yet. Obviously, I'm just like grooming things. Um, so I have everything separated. So I have the hair itself right there. And then I have this blend here, which is just like this slightly thicker hair. Let's see, where is it? This one. So it's like the thicker hair. This one is going to blend to the peach fuzz itself. So the peach fuzz, it's the vellus hair in here. So I have this one. So the peach fuzz starts like very thin and small. And then it starts getting a little bit thicker and a little bit longer when it gets closer in here. All of that to create some kind of like transition between those forms. You know, if I open, for example, like, uh, let's say, Giger here. See, like there's some thinner ones in here. Even I think Rick Baker had some better transition somehow. Yeah, there's some thin ones. Yeah, it's hard to see in here. But uh, yeah, let's see if my old lady. Yeah, I think she has plenty of those. So it has like this thinner hair in there. And everything starts with the peach fuzz itself and then becomes more of this uh, bland transition. And then it becomes the hair itself, you know. And you you cover this in your course. Someone's asking. If you oh yeah, it. everything is covered in the course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so for the eyelashes, that's what I was talking about before. So about like double the the density at the top than what I have in the in the lower part. Uh, what I try to do with the eyelashes as well is to when before I start the grooming, I select like let's say like two or three rows of uh, faces. Because sometimes people select just one, it looks like dull, you know, it's like everything is just like linear. Uh, and if you have like, a, if you look at the references of eyes, you're going to find out that they actually spread quite a bit. They have like some ups and downs in there. Um, and then, yeah, there's a lot of stuff, like there's, you know, some nose hair, you know, it's like all this stuff. <laughs> Gotta have that ear hair. Yeah, you know, you know so ear hair and all that stuff. Right. And then, Can't uh, forget any of that stuff. <laughs> yeah. So when it comes like to the to the skin tone, then let's talk about this last part here, which is the skin tone itself. Uh, those are all like from the internet references I found, but it's pretty much like the they all kind of agree in a way. Uh, a little bit more yellow towards forehead, a little bit mm. more red towards the center, especially with males, right? Because of yeah. the you know we're gonna have like blue, green, and gray around this mm -hmm. area. Same example you can see around here. This is a little bit more you know. Uh, separated so a little bit more complex in there same yeah. with this one simplified version a little bit more complex in here so when I start to paint my colors my albedo everything is done in HD geometry and I try to try to do something like this you know it's like to incorporate those uh, those those colors um, but yeah, so then you're poly painting in ZBrush when you're everything painting. is poly painted so oh, yeah. before yeah oh. let me just uh, go back in here to the model to show you guys what I have so this is the model here just with the sketch hair and then let's look at the albedo that i have in here let's switch to hd first so i'm gonna go here so the entire face if you plan your model correctly you can get the entire face in hd uh, as long as you have around like between 40 45 million polygons you should be able to actually accommodate everything into hd so the entire face here works in hd so i'm gonna press a i'm gonna go to hd here and now if i press solo i can just see exactly what i can sculpt in hd and this one here obviously shows the whole thing, but I can only sculpt within this area. So uh, if I switch to show you my albedo, it looks like this, like the flat color. So this is all hand painted. And wow. uh, taking into account, I mean, like I start with that uh, same structure, right? Like a little bit more blue around here, a little bit more red in the center, a little bit more yellow at the top. But then everything is painted, keeping in mind uh, the structures and microstructures of the face. That means that I'm never going to go 
with a plain color and just paint a huge amount of, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a huge portion of the face with a single color. Uh, like I said before, if you look at something like this, uh, let's look at uh, Peter here, for example. You see his nose, for example. Uh, when you look at someone like this, uh, the tendency is to just think like, oh, he has a, a red nose. And you don't even think about it. You just like go and paint, paint the nose slightly more red. But then when you start looking at what makes his nose look red, you're going to see those micro veins, for example. Some are deeper and more diffuse. Some are a little bit more sh shallow, a little bit more in the surface and much more defined. Uh, and then in between the pores in here and everything, you're going to see echoes of the same structures. You know, it's like the tiny micro uh, veins in here represented. This is what's causing this redness to happen in here. And the blackheads, for example, they, they have the name blackhead. But if you paint it black, it's going to look completely awkward in your model. <laughs> so uh, the tendency is to actually try to paint them slightly uh, darker than the skin itself. Sometimes a little bit more towards orange brown, you know. Uh, they should be called brown heads. Uh, <laughs> yep. I'll give you a time check too, Chris. Ten minutes. Yeah. So you know. Yeah. There you go. And oh, uh, so when I when I paint my structures in here, I try to incorporate uh, a lot of this. You know, it's like obviously here, mm -hmm. I still have to refine some more. But I mean, like I have my little lightning in here. So painted. what brush do you use? Will you build a brush for painting? Yes, for can those micro veins. So they can see it. Yeah. Uh, so for the micro veins, let's do a. Uh, let's see if I have my veins in here. So you see like this alpha here looks like lightning. Yeah. So I just switched to a color. All the colors when I use them, I don't, I, I try not to use like super saturated colors. You see like I, I went with a super red in here. I try uh -huh. to keep the colors a little bit more um, desaturated in a way. So like bring it more towards gray. And then I can add something like this. Obviously with not the same intensity, I can use like lower intensity, for example. And then I can create something that, for example, if I want to make sure that the the uh, those those details look a little bit deeper, I can actually use the alpha in here and just blur it completely. Mm -hmm. so I go to my blur here, just like blur mm -hmm. it a lot. And then when I do something like this, I can create an impression that's deeper. You know, when it comes to the detail itself in the surface, let me just switch to my material in here. Uh, it's a lot of the same that I show you guys in the previous presentation. If you if you didn't see, check that out. Like the uh, for the summit in 2018, but then a lot, a lot of uh, uh, the things I'm doing these days, instead of using the the uh, standard brush as a base, I'm actually using the elastic brush. And the difference is this: for example, if you use the elastic brush, I'm gonna just duplicate it. Gonna do like a clone in here, and then I can use like a, you know, it's like a spray. And if I switch, and I use the same brush I use for a lot of my detail, this Alpha 16 here. The difference using between using the elastic and using the standard is that the standard, if you go over the same area over and over again, it starts obliterating the whole form. But then with the with the elastic, it preserves a lot of the detail that's underneath. So let me just switch to something like very very uh, subtle in here. So let's do a let's say like 30, and then if I do something like this, let me use my tablet. Uh, let's see 20. If I go over here, I can start to actually, even after I have all my detail in place, all my pores in place and everything, that area that I mentioned, like all the directionality that I need around here, I can actually use a brush like this and just like, I don't know if you're going to be able to see, but around here, I'm actually introducing mm -hmm. some direction. Wow. Yeah, you can see it. Yeah, and it actually goes and uh, it doesn't destroy the pores themselves, you know? It's yeah. like, so you start actually incorporating that. You can actually use this in circles as well. Like if I go in circular motion like that, I can actually incorporate mm. some of this detail in circular motion. Um, but yeah, um, it's a shame. Like, I mean, like it goes so fast one hour, man. It's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I have a lot of stuff to show, but uh, yeah. But for the most part, I mean, like uh, in terms of the detail, uh, you're going to get a lot of from the previous presentation for sure. But uh, let me see what I had to go over here just to make sure that I, I hit all the main stuff first. Let's see. Let's get this one here. I was around here. Oh, actually, this one. Let me go back. So um, patterns... somebody was asked. Oh, sorry. Uh, just somebody was asking uh, how often you switch between programs for testing things out. Oh, between ZBrush and, and, and Maya? Yeah. Uh, all the time. I mean, like I... I do a sketch first, bring it straight away to Maya, do some uh, renders just to check like proportions and, and uh, you know, it's like 
how the forms behave. And then I assemble a scene from the get go. Like during my classes, we assemble a scene, I think, in the first or the second class uh, 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 lesson. And then from that point, we just iterate on that. You know, it's like, so it's, it's very early on. But uh, yeah. Uh, one thing I have to cover, I forgot here, it's uh, someone asked about like the other passes. Yeah, everything is painted in ZBrush. Very simple stuff. This is my specular level, for example. Very simple. Uh, you have to keep in mind that it's completely dependent on the how this, uh, this, the surface is being uh, broken down by detail, right? So the specular can look very simple like this, but the, the way that uh, the surface is sculpted is going to define a lot of this. And then I have this roughness passing here. And this roughness pass, what I use it for, it's basically to control how high uh, is my micro displacement. I use uh, another pass in, in, in Maya that's a micro displacement. And uh, I control how high it is. So, for example, like, uh, around the uh, eye, eyelids in here, if I want something to look shinier and a little bit more wet, I'm going to keep it completely black in here for the nose as well, a little bit shinier. Uh, and then the opposite is true as well. Like for the ears, not a lot of shininess in there or anything like that. I can actually just go back in here in my Maya and I can show you what I have. Uh, uh, last thing I forgot to mention. Okay, I, I, last thing here. <laughs> and then I can yeah. just point you to a link. So uh, one thing that I noticed is that a lot of times when you're looking at the, uh, this, this point here, albedo from scan data and overly saturated SSS effect. A lot of times when you get uh, the albedo extracted from, let's say, like a, a light stage uh, capture session, the the subsurface scattering comes ca uh, basically baked into the color itself. There's no way to remove the subsurface scattering. They, they remove like the, the specular levels because of, uh, you know, it's like they do a polarized version of it so they can remove that. But the subsurface scattering is always baked. So what I try to do with my color before I can render anything, I try to desaturate everything. Imagine like if you see like a dead body in the morgue, for example, like uh, all the, the, the blood is not in the surface anymore. So you get this kind of like desaturated pale bluish kind of tone. So uh, basically that's what I do uh, behind the curtain here is like use a color correction node f uh, before I can actually plug my color into the subsurface so I can actually desaturate things and turn things a little bit more bluish and everything, you know. Um, but uh, I'm going to point you guys since uh, we are not going to have time to, to actually explore everything, I'm going to point you to a couple of links in here and that's going to be very useful for you. So the first one is going to be uh, this one here, you can go to my uh, another plug. So I have a, a YouTube channel now. There is this video here. You can check this behind the work HDR Giger. So if you go to this one, I actually break down like the the shader network, how I'm plugging. Uh, deta de I actually detailed quite well how I plugged like my specular levels. Uh, you know, so I can use the micro displacement to actually break break up the the, the specular and everything. So check that video out. Uh, another one for you to check is this guy here. Uh, he has an Instagram. His uh, Instagram name is this, uh, Joe's Lock Bower. And he has a ton, he has a collection of uh, 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 life casts, right? So life casts are very important to be able to, to understand like the, you know, the, the skin structures and everything, but not as reliable for likeness as you might think, because there's a lot of pressure uh, that happens, uh, you know, it's like uh, on the face when you're casting because of the, the, the heavy materials being deposited in there. Uh, but uh, from a light stage, you can actually rely on the likeness much more. But still, this is a great resource like for, you know, for um, uh, skin detail and things like that. And then the 3D scan store, they have a lot of awesome scans in there you can study from. Uh, I, I particularly don't have any, but I really like, you know, it's like to look at lists like in the images from the website. I kind of end up like buying some stuff for sure just to get, uh, you know, it's like a, a, a better idea about this type of, you know, detail we get from the from the scans themselves. And then obviously the eyes, you know, it's like a, if you type some, something in Google, like eye close up, you're going to find a lot of awesome reference in there. Um, you know, it's like for sculpting the iris, very important stuff. And all of the stuff I spoke about here, obviously I go like into full on detail for like close to 40 hours in my classes, if you guys are interested. Um, and if not, I mean, like uh, in my YouTube channel, I'm constantly posting different things that I, I go over uh, things in a little bit more detail. So uh, check it out. Yeah. Yeah, I know there's a website too. You think you can uh, purchase actors' life casts. I can't remember what it is, though. Yeah. What it is. 
but it's like multiple generations though it's not obviously an original you're they're casting i think from an original from an original that's now been cast and cast and cast mm -hmm. I, know that, I know there's one that exists out there hey that, you mentioned you mentioned the hulk uh before like uh, mark yeah. ruffalo uh the interesting thing is that when we did that uh we got the life uh, the the life cast right like the scan yeah. of the life cast and we got the light stage as well so with both of them i was able to actually project everything into uh, two different models and then i could pick and choose what detail worked the best and it's very interesting because the likeness you can trust for the light stage obviously because there's no contact but then for the skin itself we got a lot of awesome detail from the life cast so like you know especially neck and things like that was pretty cool i love that you guys put his fingerprints on it on fingerprints <laughs> is a great fact i love that well he grabbed the camera right doesn't he grab the camera that's why you did it right doesn't he grab the camera and put it um uh, the there's on? There is a shot that actually, there is this super slow motion punch. He punches one of those big creatures. I actually modeled those creatures too. Oh, yeah? Yeah, and uh, and you can see a little bit of the, the fingerprints. <laughs> well, it's just, it just goes to how much detail you put in. And I think that also goes to show to your work that you're doing with portraits. Like, it looked like you had a personal, like, uh, photo, uh, in, like, someone's photo book for some of those <laughs> pictures with Frank, right? Yeah. You were, like, at his house. <laughs> And go, oh, there's good pictures. Let me take some pictures. <laughs> you do some serious research on the internet looking, you know, diving into the character as much as possible. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's like a, a, when I started doing those portraits, I thought I would be kind of like, you know, I'm going to get tired very soon. But then every single character is a completely different challenge, you know. It's like in, right. every time you look at this uh, the skin structures and everything, it's like super different. For example, this little guy here, he had progeria. He died uh, years ago. And uh, he died when he was 17, so, but they, they look like uh, old people, you know? But at the yep. same time, the, the, the skin itself is kind of like baby-like, you know? It's like, it's very thin. So every single portrait, I try to challenge myself and try to see things a little bit differently, you know? It's like a, a little bit tan, a tanner skin or, uh, you know, it's like a, there's a lot that happens. I mean, like if you start looking deeply, for example, the Velo's hair, which is the, the peach fuzz, uh, it varies wildly depending off the type of uh, ethnicity, for example. You're going to get more or less of it. Uh, same for like facial hair, like, you know, it's like uh, over your your, your uh, upper lip, for example. Uh, I was looking at this, like there is a paper comparing like women and, uh, you know, it's like the little mustache in women. <laughs> because normally those things are related to products that they sell, like for, uh, you know, beauty stuff. Yeah. And one of those papers talking about like Indian, uh, you know, Asian Indian women have more and then you know it's like it goes like uh there is like a Japanese and then you know it's like they compare yeah, just, all those things this hair color there's different numbers like yeah. red I think has yeah. the thickest hair mm -hmm. and then every hair color's got different oh, yeah. number of spans of hair it's, it's amazing man it's yeah. uh, it, the amount of variation you get like doing portraits it's uh, it's it's uh, endless you know it, that that's what keeps keeps me dr driven you know it's like to do more of it right yep wow yeah. Well, this was awesome, Jeez. Chris. Yeah, I, I encourage. He was he was talking about his 2018. I encourage you guys going to check that out too. Um, probably when we're done with the summit this year, we'll be breaking off, and we can add that in the link on our YouTube as well, so you guys can see that because you go through all your brushes and your alphas. And yes, that, yes, and that a, a lot of that as well. Because I, I was afraid of being redundant, and those yeah. things I spoke about today, they're so important for the life of the character that goes a little bit beyond the technique itself, you know? So, uh, yeah. 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 Well, this is amazing. awesome. Again, again, his <laughs> studio is, uh, if you want to put your studio information back up again, too, sure. so people are aware of that, mm -hmm. um, fly on the wall, fly on the wall studio, this guy, there you go. <laughs> so there's his URL. So you guys have that as well. I know some of you are like, all right, I got to take your class now. So <laughs> that way people are aware of that. And then your, uh, YouTube, Right, he shared that as well on this. Yeah, the, the, the this entry is recorded was... people, so you can go back and watch it. So yeah. there's his YouTube. Mm -hmm. uh, you can yeah. find. Oh, it. I love I love your YouTube channel too. I've been I've been lurking. Oh, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah, I, I had it for a while, but I never posted anything. And then I, a month ago, I started posting stuff, and I was like, oh, that's that's kind of fun. <laughs> yeah. No, you you talk about things in such a great way. It's excellent. I re recommend everybody go and subscribe. Go. Oh, thank you. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> awesome well chris thank you so much and thank you for taking your sunday uh part of your sunday with us as well i know you got stuff going on at home and busy and then so i appreciate you taking time to come and share all this information oh, with us. It's, that it's was awesome. perfect because i'm in between jobs man so i have all the time right now <laughs> oh that's awesome, <laughs> awesome. yeah
So well, thanks again, guys, like Paul, uh, Ashley, and, you know, it's like everybody involved, uh, Jaime, Kyle, everybody involved, you know, it's like, again, like I have a, such a long relationship with Pixelogic uh, back, like, uh, I would say 20 years, I would say, when mm -hmm. I started, you know, back when you, were, you, back when you were the banker in Brazil. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I really appreciate, I mean, like a, a lot of my career, as I posted in my latest video on YouTube, I mean, like it, it's around it, ZBrush, basically, you know, it's like a lot of stuff uh, related to my personal work and my growth as an artist and in this industry, you know, it's like it, it was completely connected to how ZBrush developed as well. So I really appreciate everything. Awesome. All right. Well, Chris, we'll let you get on with your rest of your Sunday. And Ashley and I are going to get gear up for the next presentation with id software. So, Chris, thank you. <laughs> thank you, guys. For being Thanks, a part Chris. Of <laughs>